I know uh, during your prayer time, you prayed for our 23 uh, folks on their way to Honduras on the medical trip. And uh, there's one other group though we need to pray for. There's 250 fifth and sixth graders and volunteers at camp. And being at camp with that many fifth and sixth graders makes a mission trip to the worst part of the world sound appealing. <laughs> <laughs> but pray for those volunteers, and uh, as, they, as they really, some of you were fifth and sixth grade and went to that camp uh, back when, so let's keep them in our prayers as well as uh, they finish up tomorrow and then come home, and uh, I'm just thankful for all the cool things going on around this place uh, in the summertime. It, it's pretty exciting, and really year-round. Uh, I felt compelled this summer to uh, call us back uh, to our priority as a church not that we've left it behind, but just as a reminder of what really matters and why we're here. If somebody came up to you and said, why do you go to crossings? There's, there's a multitude of answers, uh, good answers. I go to, some, some would say, I go to crossings because I love the music or the worship. Some would say, I love my Sunday school class or I love my teacher or I love my small group or, or whatever. There, there's an overarching reason I think uh, we come to crossings, or at least if you don't yet, maybe this would be the overriding reason, because you see, all these other things I just mentioned are wonderful things, but uh, they can't always, maybe 100% of the time, because it's, we're all human beings, uh, you know, ring the bell like you want it rung, so to speak. So if someone were to say, why do you come to crossings? One of the things I typically say is, well, I love my church because it's a Christ-centered church. That's a big deal. We don't just say that because we, you know, it's obvious. Well, duh. We say that because that's a big deal. There are a lot of churches who aren't Christ-centered. And we are. We're a Christ-centered church shining the bright light of Christ in this city and beyond. That's why I go to crossings. Everything else is great. It can be good or bad or in between. But I go to crossings because we lift up Jesus. It's a Christ-centered church shining the bright light of Christ in this city and beyond. And the problem we have is, as, as any church, if we're not careful, suddenly you can be making the wrong thing the main thing. Back when I uh, did some training of pastors over in the Netherlands, one of the things that just was astounding to me, in every city we would go to throughout Holland and that area of the, of the world, there'd be these massive, beautiful cathedrals in all the town squares. They'd been built right there in the middle of the town, and they're empty. They're tourist attractions. Nothing much happens inside of them anymore. So, so in other words, picture with me a church that was built, a beautiful church that was built in all these town squares throughout Europe. You, you'll find these in all, oftentimes in the town, literally a town square, and it's where the market is set up every day. And so one, once, once upon a time, the church, that church was vibrant, and it met needs, and it did something significant in the community. But somewhere along the way, they lost sight of what they were there to do. And now they're a tourist attraction. Christ-centered means if Jesus said it, we believe it. If Jesus modeled it, we want to live it. If Jesus commanded it, we want to obey it. We believe everything Jesus practiced and preached, and we believe it's relevant for us today as just as much as it was the time that Jesus said it verbally when he was walking this earth. We believe Jesus Christ is God's only son. We believe his earthly life and ministry demonstrated and proved this, that everybody matters to God. Everybody our roots, Jason was talking about our roots in the Church of God Anderson. There are conventions here. Many of you are already here for the convention. And uh, our roots, I'm, I'm third generation in this. Well, the thing I've loved about how I was raised in this church, a church like much like Crossings, is that it was all about Jesus. And we didn't get sidetracked. And we didn't lose our vibrancy. And we didn't let our light dim. Because it was all about Jesus. And we didn't fuss over doctrine. And we didn't fuss over our differences. And we didn't fuss over our disagreements. We just kept the focus on Jesus. Because Jesus is the only perfect one in this whole equation. Because we're all just flawed human beings doing the best we can any given day. Everybody matters to God. That's why we just want to lift Christ up and shine his light as bright as we can to this community and the world for that matter. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world because it's the door through which men walk when they find God. When I became the pastor of our, this church, I'd been the associate pastor for four years. Some of you have heard this story, uh, but I'm going to repeat it. Uh, at this point in my life, I'm repeating everything anyway, so uh, bear with me. You know, I don't know when I said this last, but who cares? I'm going to say it again. 
<laughs> so it's been a while. I know it's been a while. It's been a couple of years. All right. So I became the pastor of this little church at the time, uh, about 145 people. And uh, they asked me to be the pastor, and I thought it was a really bad idea, but uh, here we are. I, I truly did. I didn't have a ministry degree, really. I had, a, had some religious studies degree and business degree and music degree. Those are my fields of study. And uh, suddenly, I'm the pastor. So in October of 1985, almost 29 years ago, I moved my one box, small box of books into the pastor's study <laughs> office. He had an office with ceiling to floor bookshelves. And I had just about this many books on one of the shelves. I was going to garage sales buying any book I could find. I didn't care what was in it. It was a book. It made me look intelligent. You know, oh, look at all those books. Have you read all those books? You know, um, no, but anything I could do just to at least make the look a little better than it was. Well, there was another box of books that I'd moved from Ohio with when I came out here in 1981, and I'd never even opened it. I just kind of had it packed away, and it was in a closet. So I thought, oh, there's a box of books. I can use those. So I got that box of books out. They were a box of books of my dad's books. My dad was a pastor for 30 years. I opened that box, and this was laying on top. It had my dad's name in it. I said, I stand by the door. And I'd never really, I'd never heard of the book. I'd never heard of the author, Sam, or Sam Shoemaker. It, it, the book's about Sam Shoemaker, written by his wife, Helen Smith Shoemaker. And I started reading the jacket. And all of a sudden, I got really interested because it says in New York, he transformed a struggling parish in the inner city into a dynamic spiritual center. He helped to found Alcoholics Anonymous. He was very key in the early ministry of recovery. I got really interested in this. And I thought, I wonder why my dad has it. And then... I went to the very first page, and here it was, I stand by the door. It's the theme of, Sam Shoemaker said, this is the theme for my life. I stand by the door. And I knew why my dad loved this, because that's my dad. My dad's never met a stranger to this day. He'll talk to anybody. He'll, he'll, talk, uh, he'll talk forever to anybody that will listen. He's never met a stranger. And I read this, and it kind of got a hold of me. And I thought, you know, I can really relate to that. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out because this door is the most important door in the world. It's the door through which men walk when they find God. I want to talk about that. Matthew chapter 9, we find this text. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, now here we're getting the picture of the problem then. And folks, if you think that was just limited to then, think again. This could be describing today as much as it could have been describing then. Because the Pharisees were the religious people. They were good religious people. Uh, very loyal, very diligent religious people, but they let it go so far in, into an elitist type of arrangement in their religion of that day. So when the Pharisees, the religious people, these were good church-going people, when they saw Jesus having dinner with tax collectors and sinners, they raised a question. It's like, why is he doing that? Why, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. You see, the religious people of that day were all about keeping sinners out. They were all about keeping sinners out. There are churches today that whether it's blatant or not are sort of all about keeping the wrong people out. Keeping sinners out. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I, I want mercy. Let's, let's be merciful. Let's be gracious and merciful people, not sacrifices. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Religious people were all about keeping sinners out. Jesus was all about bringing sinners in. I get uh, all kinds of email and comments and letters and notes and things like that. And most of them are nice. Uh, some are really not, uh, but uh, we read them all. Um, I dare you to start sending me, though, a, a different kind of email. In fact, I want you to get your uh, 
your response card out right now, if you would. It's, it's the bottom half of your connection card. If you go ahead and just take out your response card and have it handy, uh, because I'm going to ask you to use that before this, this service is over. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to invite the church. I've invited uh, four of our service. This is our fourth service of five, so I've got one more to go. But I'm, I'm inviting everyone to send uh, the staff, to send one of our pastors, to send me a different kind of email, a different kind of note, different kind of card different kind of comment. You see, here's what I would love to be reading this week. I'd love to be reading a couple of thousand of you who are saying, Marty, pray for me as I reach out to someone and help them find the door that will lead them to a whole new life. See, I, don't, I hardly ever get that kind of email. And I think we need to change that. I'll stay up all night and read that kind of email. Marty, please pray for this person. Pray for me as I try to reach this person. I had a lady in the last service. The last service was just amazing what the comments were, and there'll be more coming out of this service. I'll tell the next service about you and your comments because a lady came up to me and she said, man, Marty, I feel like maybe I've just been radically called to something. I said, what do you mean? She said, all of my family are non-believers, all of them. I said, okay. She said, and they all live in another state. Oh. She said, I think God just called me to go live there. I think God wants me to go live there and go get them and go show them the door. I just encourage you to start thinking about that. Write that name down on that response card. This is the first way you can. We read all these. This is a great first step for you to start saying, let's make the main thing the main thing here. Let's start praying for people that we are all in contact with, who we love and deeply care about. And more than anything, we would love for them to know what it feels like to be forgiven and have the, all the junk of your life erased and set free and be clean for something greater. Let's do that. Give me some notes about that. Jesus was all about bringing sinners in, and we've been called to do the same. I made a bold statement a few weeks ago, and I kind of thought about it that afternoon, wondering maybe that was, I don't like, I don't, you know, you don't need to feel bad and beat up because we get enough of that from the world. But I do want to challenge you, and I'm going to say it again, because I really thought, no, that wasn't to beat you up, but it was to make you think, and I want to make you think again. If you are not actively engaged with someone who is not in with someone who is not a follower of Christ. If you are not actively engaged with someone who is not a follower of Christ, there's something wrong and it needs to change. I have to purposefully force myself weekly to get out of the holy huddle. This is a phenomenal holy huddle. I mean, I, it's just a phenomenal thing that happens to be a part of this church. If, if this is a holy huddle, it's got to be one of the best because I just love our holy huddle, but I've got to force myself to get out of the huddle, out of my comfort zone, and make sure I'm in tune with some people around me who need some light in their life, who've been looking for a door and all they find is a wall. Let me keep reading this. There's no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they are looking for a door and all they find is a wall where a door ought to be. We'll come back to that. Jesus was all about bringing sinners in. And, and here it comes. This is going to be, I hope you take this well, with the rest of us sinners. See, it's all about bringing sinners in with the rest of us. Have we forgotten we're not perfect either? Can you remember when you were once walking in darkness? Who came after you? Who rescued you? Who grabbed you by the hand and walked you through the door? The door to life with Christ. The most important door in the world. Have we forgotten that someone, maybe somewhere in our life, a group of people, a church, wrapped their arms around us and believed in us and gave us a second chance and stuck with us and loved us and helped us know the shepherd the text continues, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he said, as the Lord of the harvest, then therefore to uh, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. That's us. 
He said, there are people out, this is Jesus' way of painting a picture in those days, that there was this world in desperate need, and we have the answer. And we don't go arrogantly or cocky. We go out there because we love other people because we remember what it was like to be lost. And we want to go love other people who, who don't know that they can be loved and forgiven. He says, look, I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out. And he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. I don't know about you, but you know, you know what a wolf does to a sheep? <laughs> it isn't pleasant. Why would he say that? You see, because I'd rather go out like a wolf. I'm going to go out in power. I'm going to go take back this something for God, you know. I'm going to go out there and conquer. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I want you to do. I don't want you to go out like a wolf. I want you to go out like sheep. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. I'm sending you out in compassion and in love and humility. And we gather here every week to be encouraged and reminded why we must be salt and light and why we must let Jesus send us out. We gather so we can go make a difference. Because you see, the church is not something you go to. It's something you go from. And I don't know about you, but I need this hour a week to get my perspective. And I mean, it, I need more than one hour a week, and most of us do, because I don't know about you, but between now and next Sunday, I'm going to have all kinds of things try to take my focus off what matters. I'm going to have all kinds of temptations that are going to make me think something's better than it really is. I need this hour, and I need a whole lot more than this hour, quite frankly, through the week, to keep my focus, to keep my perspective, to help me remember what really matters. I need that. Church is not something you go to. It's something you go from. Back to I stand by the door. There's some that must inhabit those inner rooms of the church and know the depths and heights of God, but my place seems closer to the door, so I stand by the door. It's probably 25 years ago. I um, got a phone call at the church. We were very small then, as you might imagine. Uh, I'd been the pastor at that point uh, about... Um, I mean, I'd been on the staff probably seven years or so, and uh, we had been the associate pastor, youth pastor, then I became the, the pastor, the main pastor, and uh, I used to say it's senior pastor, that used to mean you were in charge, now it means you're old, <laughs> so um, I, was, I became the senior pastor, and so um, got a phone call, church was very small then, and uh, I picked up the phone and answered it, it was a rainy afternoon, remember it like it was yesterday. And a young man in our church, 13, 14 years old, was on the other end of the phone. When I came to this church, he was about seven years old. And this was a kid that you just loved. Full of life, vibrant, curious, never met a stranger kind of guy. And what made him even more special, to me at least at the time, and to many really, was that his grandfather and grandmother helped start this church. His grandparents were in church the first Sunday this church came into existence in March of 1959. In fact, his grandfather appointed himself that first Sunday as the head usher. Some of you remember this. And he remained our head usher for 40 years until we moved into this building. His name was Johnny Jones. Johnny was something. Johnny and Gwen were amazing people. Raised their daughters, Carol and Renee, in this church. They're both still a vital part of this place. Renee works in our pastoral care office. That rainy afternoon when Sean called and I answered, he had just finished the ninth grade, had already been in treatment for alcohol problems. He was home alone and he couldn't find his sponsor. By then I'd been acquainted with 12 Steps and I knew how important a sponsor was. So he called the church. I knew by the sound of his voice he needed me right now, so I immediately went to his house, out off MacArthur, picked him up, Took him home. Kim fixed us a great dinner. And then once his mom was home from work, uh, we took him back home. Just a, just a great kid. Still a great kid. He's just 40 years old. Well, eventually, he found himself in pretty major trouble with drugs, alcohol, and was making his way under a bridge here in Oklahoma City to end his life. He had had enough. But that's not where the story ends. So have a look at the screens, if you will, for the rest of the story.
Well, this is where I used to spend a lot of nights when I was homeless. Uh, this is where I would come, a place that I felt safe. And just something about this place, just, just like a little temporary home, really. When you're homeless, it, it's really hard to find a comfortable place, especially at nighttime. The darkness starts closing in, and it's just, it's a really scary place to be all alone at night outdoors. Yeah, everything's going good as far as going to college and playing tennis, and, but the, uh, the partying has also come around just as strong to where at this point I'm starting to care more about my dealing drugs and doing drugs than I care at all about school. I'm more going to school just to go through the motions. What I really lived for was the nighttime. Lost all contact altogether, stopped praying, stopped going to church, and just the God that I was growing with, I, I turned my back on him. I started doing things like gambling, stealing. I would wander around neighborhoods just looking for things to steal. Pawn shop opens up the next day, that's how you make your money to get more meth. Doing things that I never would have thought possible. Living in places like this. When I would come down and would be in my right mind, I would think about that. And it would just make me start crying because I didn't know God well enough at that time to realize that there was another chance out there. I thought I had totally blown it and that it was over. It was about four in the morning around Memorial Day weekend of 2011, and I was walking around by myself with about an 80 pound duffel bag on my shoulder. I finally had to put the bag down. It was more than I could carry that night. I was just tired and, well, just about to, about to completely lose it. And I got over by the bridge over on the interstate and just started crying, screaming to the sky, just telling God how sorry I was. I was totally brokenhearted for no reason at all. You kind of start running through a list in your head of, am I really gonna do this or am I not? When you're really considering it, some serious things pop in your head and well, I ran into a stumbling block, a big stumbling block, and that was who was gonna be able to explain to my son Mason why his daddy had done this to himself, why his daddy had taken his own life. And right at that minute, I knew that I wasn't gonna take my own life. I did not want to keep living and using drugs and stealing the things that I'd been doing to get to this point. The choices that I'd been making had gotten me to this point and I didn't wanna do it anymore. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And here's my friend, Sean. Sean, Sean doesn't know this. Um, have a seat. Um, 
But a, a guy came up to me in the last service, and uh, an older gentleman, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, um, my son didn't make it out from under the bridge. And so all the more reason why we got to go find these folks. And I'm glad somebody found Sean, and who would have dreamed when you, your grandparents would be, and maybe, maybe heaven lets them know this, that when you came out of that worst moment of your life into a ministry, lo and behold, it was a ministry of the very church your grandparents helped start. And that's just pretty cool stuff. And next Friday? Three years. Three years. Right. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. I previewed that video a couple of times. That's the fourth time I've seen it this morning, and I lose it every time. And I'm just so thrilled what's going on. But folks, this is just an example of what our privilege is if we'll just stand by the door and help people like Sean find that door. The, the statement from... Sam Shoemaker continues, I stand by the door. I admire the people who go way in, hear me now, but I wish they wouldn't forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help the people who have not yet even found the door. You see what happens to churches that lose their focus? It happens because we forget how it was before we got in. I want to be a doorkeeper. And the mission of this church is not to go out into the world out of disgust and shape it up. It's to go out in the world with compassion and help it out. I want you to write down on that card you have in your hand, your response card, somebody's name. If you don't know somebody's name right now, I don't want you to feel guilt about that, but I, do, I would like you to Leave this place today and begin saying, God, send me to somebody. Let's go find them. Because it's all about Jesus. And I'm going to stand by the door. That's where I love to be. And there's a lot of folks who like to stand there with me, but we need more. And I'm asking you, will you stand by the door? You write that person's name down on your card. Put it in the blue boxes at the back as you leave the building. And we're going to start praying for the person you're reaching so you can lead them through the door. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that we can celebrate today Sean's story, and we know there are many more stories right here in front of us just like it. Father, help us. Please help us, Father, to not lose to not lose what is important, to not lose our perspective, to not, to not forget that those of us who are in now, it's all about helping those who aren't in yet. It's not about forgetting them. Father, send us out of this place. You've sent us. We want to go. Help us, Father, to be people who will help people find the door instead of a wall as we lift up Jesus to those folks. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.